Bliss and Grit is an entirely listener-supported show. Supporting us is also designed to support you through keeping the episodes rolling, but also through rewards for your donation, like a getting started guide, a private forum, and downloadable meditations. To become a supporting member, you can visit patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Hello, beautifuls. You are listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Brooke Thomas, and I'll be joined soon by my dear friend and co-host, Vanessa Scotto. And this week, we're doing a Flashback Tuesday episode here. So this was originally recorded in June of 2018 with our special guest, Matt Kahn. And Vanessa and I wound up this week with a scheduling conflict where we couldn't record. And Matt just celebrated his birthday. And we're about to go see him in Austin, where Vanessa lives. So he's on our minds. And we just thought it'd be nice to revisit this one for those of you who haven't heard it or who don't you know, go back and revisit episodes. Our producer is kind enough to remaster it. So the audio quality will be better as well. And if you listen to Bliss and Grit on the regular, you're probably well familiar with Matt, but if you aren't, he's an empathic healer and teacher who is obviously very dear to both my and Vanessa's hearts. And we hope you enjoy revisiting or hearing for the first time this episode. Matt has a truly uncanny ability to bring the wide open miraculous and root it right down into our shared humanity. If you're enjoying the show, there are a few ways you can support us. You can leave a review on iTunes or Facebook. You can head over to blissandgrit.com and subscribe. We do send out a weekly digest. Or you can find out about becoming one of our supporting members on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash blissandgrit. And huge thank you to all of you who are already patrons and who are supporting the show. Lastly, a little side note, uh, we do see clients privately. That's our, that's how we make our living. That's what we do. We help people on their paths. So there's also information about that on the website too. And lastly, Vanessa and I are sometimes very sweary, but I, if I recall, I think this conversation with Matt is pretty G-rated, but you never know. There might be a, a little swear word in there here and there. <laughs> so you might want to be aware of that depending on the company that you're in. Okay, here we go. So hi, Vanessa, and we're here with Matt Kahn. Hi, Matt. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's truly an honor to be here with you both. We're so excited. And oh. people who listen to the show know that we're big fans of yours. We've been on a retreat with you. We do whole episodes based on a note we take from your book or YouTube video. <laughs> so we're fans. <laughs> That's how they found us. Yes. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, one of the things that's unique about you, we talk with teachers and usually we're talking with teachers who are kind of pretty solidly in the non-dual camp. And one of the things that's really unique about you is that you're very much a non-dual teacher, but you're also um, bringing in the mystical. And I would say you're also incredibly practical and just here and really grounded. So all of those things come together in a way where your teachings just have a great deal of freshness and clarity. Um, and we usually start by asking people like, the word awakening, certainly the word enlightenment, these are words that have gotten really crusty, you know, really corrupted um, and confused, <laughs> crusty words. So yeah. a great start place might be, what do you mean by the word or the process awakening or um, what enlightenment teachings are? What does that mean? <clears throat> I think it's a really great place to start. I, I, when you think of the word awakening, and, and in my new book, Everything is Here to Help You, I really highlight the classic sh you know, shift from out of the pitfalls of ego and to the illuminated presence of your soul. Of course, the ego and the soul being two aspects of the one, but they're not actually two different things. It, just in the same way that when a child can be seen as an adult in training, hmm. the soul is evolving to integrate into the oneness of the soul. So really the soul is the mature adult self 
of the evolving ego. And when we talk about awakening, I think just to give it the most practical expression, I think what we're talking about is the embodiment and the activation of spiritual maturity. That when we're children, we might react instead of respond. We might act in a way that we might regret at a future moment. We might act from our fears or our desires for instant gratification. And as adults, hopefully, we can give things a more deeper look and we can make decisions based on our core values, not just our desires, needs, wants, and wishes. So in that, in that analogy, awakening is where we mature on a soul level and when we're willing to make decisions that embody our highest core values and give credence to the greatest amount of trust with the universe versus just the constant hamster wheel of acting out the orbiting of our human conditioning. So when we speak about awakening, I'm talking about the embodiment of our deepest spiritual maturity. And of course, how I refer to spiritual maturity is heart-centered consciousness, not just the awareness of a greater capacity or reality, but that perspective of a bigger cosmic picture expressed through an open heart so that we are as loving as we are wise. Mm. That's beautiful. Actually, I think your teachings on ego are some of the most interesting ones I've come across. Mm. I mean, Brooke and I have been studying and practicing different things for 20 years or so. And I'm a psychologist. I mean, I know a lot about when people talk about ego. And when I heard you say that the ego is the, let me get it right, imaginary identity of an overactive nervous system. Yes. At first, I thought that's a really interesting concept, right? It's really yeah. interesting. And then over this last year, I've experienced some powerful shifts, some on retreat with you. And I thought, oh, this is not just an interesting concept. Right. This is a revolutionary gateway for people yeah. to walk through. So since your new book is so much about how do we transition from the ego's perspective to the soul's perspective, yeah. I thought we could stay on this and start to go a little deeper about what that means to you. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because I always like to find new angles of teachings. So that's my, that's my fun is, you know, I, if I teach something over and over again, I always want to find a different approach to it. So if I teach ego, I want to talk about it differently and I want to present it differently because that's my joy is always finding a new angle a new, a new nuance to create a doorway for a deeper revelation to occur. Um, when we talk about ego, you know, the imaginary identity of an overstimulated nervous system, I think one of the most down to earth ways to talk about it is if someone has an overstimulated nervous system, what is the symptom that they most commonly have in their experience? And that symptom is they don't feel safe or they maybe feel doubtful about themselves. A lot of us as energetically sensitive souls, you know, if we think about ego, we always constantly think of the classic narcissistic ego structure and people go, well, I don't think I'm better than anyone. So I guess I don't have an ego. Mm -hmm. But in reality, there are some ego structures that are fed by thinking they're better than others. And there are some egos that are fed by thinking they're less than others. Mm -hmm. And if we're energetically sensitive souls, we are constantly thinking that we are less than others, we're not meeting our potential, we're somehow trailing behind in the race of life. If there's a doorway of ascension, I'm clearly not going to make the window. <laughs> if there's, you know, if everyone they're loading, but me. <laughs> everyone but me, right? They're loading the plane of ascension. Hmm. And I am just still running through uh, TSA trying to make the flight. And so as energetically sensitive beings, what we have to deal with is an ego structure that is constantly fed by doubt, disempowerment, and despair. And I think it's a really interesting point to make. So as we learn to shift from the soul or from the ego's perspective to the soul's point of view, what we're allowing ourselves to do is to first recognize that I've been conditioned to always feel bad about what's happening and to either be victimized by other people or to feel victimized by my circumstances or how come the things I want seem so far away and the things I don't want seem so close at hand. And it really comes into this interesting battle with time 
And as we make peace with time, what we find is as we make peace with time, we're able to embrace the principles of greater self-care, which of course outlined in the book. And as we learn to care for ourselves and as we learn to introduce to the subconscious mind that caring for ourselves and feeling good about ourselves is familiar and not foreign we unhook from an ego structure that is fed by feeling bad and we give ourselves permission to attract things that are safe enough uh, for us to feel good. So I think if we boil it all down, the process of awakening for an energetically sensitive soul is retraining the subconscious mind to allow feeling good to feel safe and worthy instead of something that makes us feel displaced, doubtful, or unsafe in the world around us. So it's getting comfortable with and feeling safe with feeling good. That to me is more so core of what needs to happen on the awakening journey than half of the realizations that give rise to something called awakening. I mean, that's what's so interesting is there are these big realizations of I am the one and we are all connected and all of these beautiful things that I have on a daily basis, all these realizations and at the end of the day, those realizations have actually little or nothing to do with the work at hand. Mm -hmm. The work is very emotionally based. It is very intimate. And it's a deep dive into finding true safety so we can feel safe and worthy enough to feel good. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. I remember when I first came across your teachings, a friend sent them to me. And that differentiation you make between energetically sensitive beings and let's say, you know, the narcissistic type ego that they have different structures and require different um, medicine to use maybe a terrible word, but they require different <laughs> approaches. It's so helpful because I think that we, we can all have an image in our minds of the, the spiritual narcissist, you know, the sort of like I, I am better than because of my amazing realizations and as energetically sensitive beings, we can be so averse to that, but we're actually doing the opposite thing. We're always holding ourselves underneath less than. And so we can't ever, like you were saying, I mean, for, for me, I know that it's been such an amazing process to realize, oh, the work is feeling safe with what feels good and mm. content, like feeling safe with it's just content is such a big, right. amazing process. Who knew? It's not well, just absolutely. a big blammo. <laughs> well, the big blammo is nice. And then the journey to integrate the blammo mm -hmm. um, is a whole other thing. So realization happens in an instantaneous moment. But then to integrate that is the path, is, is the lifetime. And just to kind of make it simple. So what is the medicine for a narcissist to realize to realize there's something bigger than myself mm. in the world, to serve something bigger than myself. You know, a lot of narcissists, the narcissistic spiritual path is like a spiritual 12-step program, basically. Mm. Right? So when surrender, I forgive, oh my goodness, oh my God, so-and-so, I've been spiritually drunk for 40 years, I'm so sorry, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. But the path of a spiritually, you know, energetically sensitive soul is not to realize, it's to receive. So the narcissist realizes as their medicine and the energetically sensitive soul or the inferior ego, as I call it, awakens the ability to receive. Mm. And so when we awaken, we awaken the worthiness to receive all that source has to offer us as a confirmation that we know ourselves as nothing but source, just as for a superior ego structure or a narcissist their realization into source is to realize the greater perspective outside their personal view. And if we think there's just one path, and I see this a lot with energetically sensitive souls, you know, they, they constantly are denying the personal self as if the denial of the personal self is the gateway into a transcendent state of consciousness. And it's very easy to deny and to uh, surrender your personal self when you don't like the character you're playing in life, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like what's the percentage of people who have loved their life circumstances, who have completely wanted to abandon themselves? Probably none. Mm 
Right. <laughs> Not that many. Oh, I'm the character that always gets blamed. No one likes me. Like, oh, I get it. I, I'm going to wake up out of ego. And there is an awakening out of ego. But for if you're energetically sensitive, your ego trip is not feeling good enough to receive. Like you do something amazing and then someone goes, oh my God, you're amazing and your subconscious mind goes, oh my God, you're about to feel good for the first time in your life. We have to reject that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. a, a narcissist has to wake up enough to realize and an energetically sensitive one has to awaken deep enough to receive. And only when we can receive do we know how safe we truly are that's what unravels the nervous system, collapses the old ego structure, and creates space for this awakening soul to be embodied. I mean, it's always been so phenomenal if you observe yourself. I'm one of those people who was very attached to the less than identity. And you can see it. There was a certain point where I got enough space to see, okay, I can't be the only one so screwed up I'm undeserving of love. I don't think that about another human, right? So how could this be? And yet you can't seem to kick the pattern, right? The thought stream is there. The feelings are there. And it's this interesting human phenomenon that we would remain attached to an identity that creates so much pain. And right. then I came on retreat with you in January. Um, I stood up and I spoke to you. I asked a question because all of a sudden, out of nowhere, seemingly, of course, uh, my sense of lifelong shame disappeared right. and it was like physically palpable as if, you know, I'm a woman. I always have like a bag with me, a pocketbook over my shoulder. And if I forget to bring it out, I'm kind of like, wait, where's my bag? It felt mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> like, where's this thing, this thing that's always with me. And I, I went up and I spoke to you about it and I said, will this come back? Right. Is this just one of those lovely blamos and then I go back to feeling a certain way but I know I can and you said there's no reason to expect that which was lovely because as much as sometimes I think we can seek a fast resolution to our problems I think we can also believe everything is going to be slow and hard work and it's going right. to take a lot of effort and you know what it didn't come back it didn't come back <laughs> Amazing. And yeah. it got me thinking. It's, it's really opened up some new levels of understanding for me. So last time when I was on retreat with you in April, you were talking about how the ego can only see through polarity. That right. sort of the way that the ego works is very binary. And it just blew my mind open because, I mean, this may be my spin on it, but I'm like, oh, the ego is dualism. And through that lens, you're seeing a dualistic reality. And it's only when you can see through the eyes of the soul or experience through the heart, do you recognize that this is not a world that's only defined by good, bad, right, wrong, blame, judgment, and shame. So right. can we talk a little bit about how the ego sees through the lens of polarity? Absolutely. And just an, uh, a word that comes to me that's going to make it really like so touchable for everyone listening to this dialogue is when the ego sees through the lens of polarity, it's looking through a view of comparison. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the ego is going to say things are either right or they're wrong. They're either closer to happy or closer to sad. It's either one or the other. And just to give a personal story to kind of make, you know, to help elucidate this and, and unpack it for everyone listening so we can, you know, as we're listening to this dialogue, people can have a direct experience of it. I remember in my life when I started to really like many years ago, w wake up at a very rapid rate. And all I would do was just literally listen to my own inner channeling and I would take myself through the process. And by taking myself through the process, I would learn how to take other people through the process. And at the same time, I don't have a concrete written out process because every day it changes. I, you know, cause there's so many different dimensional ways of looking at all this. Um, but I remember once I had this very interesting contemplation of myself and I did this deconstructive contemplation where, um, I would see something and I would let there be a conclusion. I don't use the word judgment. I always say conclusion it just seems nicer, right? But judgment, right? <laughs> so pleasant. A conclusion about something. <laughs> I think like a judgment is like the intensity of your belief in a conclusion, right? There are conclusions. And if you really believe in the conclusion, 
then we have a judgment. So I'd make a conclusion about something like, ah, oh, I'm happy. And then I would ask myself, compared to what? Hmm. And I would realize that my sense of happiness were that all of the things that I would define as sadness were absent. So I must be happy because all the things defining my sadness aren't here right now. Or I'm feeling sad compared to what? Compared to a couple of days ago when the things that are making me sad weren't there. And I would realize, because people, you know, you, you hear so often, your external reality doesn't define you. Right? You hear that all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm not defined by these things. And people can even make these grandstand statements. I'm not defined by my life. And then when they're done, they go back to being defined by their life. Right? <laughs> right. Right. Yes. right. Right. I right. There is no personal <laughs> self, says the personal self. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and there's and, and again, we all have to pass through these stages. So there's no mm -hmm. judgment, of course. But it's so funny, especially on the non-dual path. It can create some very slippery, tricky business. I call it the invisible ego, right? The ego that says there's no ego, which is its own bag of tricks. But if we think of comparison, so if I had no sense of sadness, what is the real meaning of happiness? Or would, could happiness just be the way things are with nothing to interrupt it? Mm -hmm. So like even in this moment, if there was nothing to compare, there would be nothing to conclude. And if there was nothing to conclude, then life in itself is just open and flowing and one thing leads to the next. And we don't need to pause the movie to make a conclusion about it. We just watch it. Mm. That's powerful stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And yeah, it got Sorry, this is the trouble with no, the no, three-person talk, right? Right. <laughs> um, adversity, you know, so you touch on that there because a lot of times we're making conclusions about our adversity, which kind of holds it in place because then we're saying the, the problem is here, this is the issue. Um, I actually have a quote here from your book if you don't mind. <laughs> Please. Uh, so you write, since the gifts of adversity through each stage of our journey exclusively benefit the consciousness within us, only the soul can embrace such a process. Mm. And it gets back to what we were talking about in the beginning, ego versus soul, because I think uh, I have watched in spiritual circles in myself for sure. And in others, the way that the ego can try to go on this journey, as we were talking about a little bit, <laughs> like all the time. <laughs> right. And so I guess maybe diving a little bit more deeply into only, only the soul can, yeah, benefit. It's only benefiting the consciousness within us, the adversity. Can we like take a tour of that a little bit more closely? Absolutely. So, you know, every outcome that happens in life is guaranteed to create some sort of change, but it can only change you for the better. And it's only changing the evolution of consciousness because consciousness goes from its dormancy or unconsciousness into greater expansions of consciousness. So everything is trying to help evolution evolve. Just like when you're a kid, everything that happens is to help you grow. But the only thing that's growing in us and elevating and expanding is unconsciousness. You know, so we could say the ego seeks, but only the soul receives. Uh, yeah, so the awesome. ego is the one that's working hard, going towards the goal, but the only one that actually receives the benefit is the evolving soul within us. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like the ego is just the sock puppet that the hand wears. The hand is going to benefit from the journey and the sock puppet is going to be the commentary about it. Mm -hmm. um, something else I was thinking about recently, and it's like kind of like a new way of looking at it. So it's like, I'm going to share this with you for the first time ever. Oh my, God. <laughs> oh my God, a fresh new perspective on the ego. But I was thinking about this. And, you know, I've said ego is this imaginary uh, identity of an overstimulated nervous system and all these different things. And I started thinking about this. And I thought, what if the ego is a series of unconscious habits? 
Mm. happening within the consciousness of divine perfection. And that really what the ego is are the reasons, the judgments, the conclusions that justify us constantly acting out these unconscious habits. And the difference between an everyday ego, a garden variety ego, and a slippery spiritual ego is that a spiritual ego just has spiritual reasons to justify their unconscious habits. And that blew my mind when I thought about it. <laughs> yeah, that blows my mind too. And it right? makes so it like so much every, lighter. Exactly. It just makes it so yeah. much lighter and more compassionate too, that you can't hook into it in a, like a shame blame way. It diffuses right. the shame blame. Like in the beginning, right? In everyday life, like, oh my God, I, I do these unconscious things that are self-destructive and not caring for my body. I put ingredients that create inflammation and I put things in my body that perpetuate addiction or all these different things that we do, or I, you know, judge the people I, you know, that I think are judging me, all these things. And maybe the person's reason is, well, because I wasn't loved on my family or I felt abandoned by my childhood, which are all serious things that require healing. Then on the spiritual journey, people tend to do the same exact things. And all they do is they exchange their human reasons for spiritual <laughs> reasons, but the actions stay the same. So from my perspective, vibrationally, when I'm working with people at retreats individually, I scan, I can scan when I'm working. I don't do this all the time because, you know, who wants to live like that? But I <laughs> no. scan when I'm working and so I'm <laughs> working with someone and I can actually scan and feel vibrationally where they're at, which is like a progress report of the average choices being made. And I can then look at the subconscious mind. I go, I know exactly the reasons they use to make those choices. And I do that to help people, of course. Mm -hmm. But it, imagine being someone who has had a bunch of spiritual realizations and has gone through great expansion. And if you just were to step outside and look at their choices, it's almost exactly the same. What's changed is the point of view and the reasons for doing those things. I find that to be fascinating. And once people see that, that it's not about how much you've learned or realized, but have you allowed that wisdom to influence your choices and to become more empowering and nurturing and loving towards yourself? Are you willing to change the way you put food in your body? Are you willing to love your heart more often? Are you willing to love the people that may not be ready to love you back. Don't put yourself in a toxic environment. But I mean, if we're going to really be completely enamored by wisdom, how deeply are we allowing wisdom to change us? And for someone in my position, I don't demand anyone to change in my presence. I'm the one that changes the deepest and I lead by example. And for me, that's why and how I'm able to transmit this vibrationally instead of trying to walk around convincing people one by one that I'm just here to know exactly what is so, lead by example, and in my presence, it's all loving, it's all permission, and people can embrace it as deeply as they want, and I'm just here to love people through their own process. But there's a magic in that that allows something deep to wake up nearly instantaneously. It's true. We've experienced yes, we it. <laughs> and it's worth pointing to how innocent this all is, which is something yeah. you speak about a lot, because, you know, the, the fact is we're just in some measure of pain or discomfort. Right? right. And we all just want that to stop. And we do the best we can with the conditioning we have, with the nervous systems we have to figure out how to make it stop. And I think what becomes interesting when I've been on retreat with you and then spoken to people after is one of the next questions comes, how do I tell when I'm moving from an ego perspective versus when I'm moving from a soul perspective, you know, they have a decision to make. Is this just like the habitual ripening of the same point of view driving me, even if the decision looks different? Like you ever date someone and you think, finally, I'm not dating someone like my dad. And then you're <laughs> like, oh, I did it again. You know, they just looked a little different. So they're wondering, how can I tell when I'm yet again moving from ego versus when I may have shifted into a different dimension of reality and I can actually begin to see through the eyes of the soul. Absolutely. I think the easiest measuring stick, the first, you know, the first indication, the first indication is looking at our relationship with 
our external reality and of course our own inner reality. So the measurement of how, how deeply I'm moving out of ego and into the soul is, is the way I treat myself becoming nicer Mm -hmm. and is the way I'm treating other people becoming nicer. Of course, when you fully wake up, the circle becomes complete and other people are going to be as nice to you as you are to them, you know, but at the same time, everyone's going through their own journey as well. So you can't always define it by, oh, someone was mean to me. Oh, my God, let me look within and <laughs> hate myself with spiritual reasons. <laughs> <laughs> right. The measurement is not evolved is, enough. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, you're spiritually not evolved enough. You don't forgive enough. You know, these are all <laughs> sorts of things I hear from people all day long. Right. The benchmark is, are you, are you safe enough to be nice, pleasant, and polite to yourself and others? Are you safe enough to give a you-know-what about people, whether they give a you-know-what about you? It doesn't mean be someone's walk, you know, doormat and punching bag, but what is your most common response to other people? Here's a simple measuring stick or a litmus test. Have you woken up each morning and decided how you are going to respond to others before they can respond to you. Mm. Like I wake up in the morning and I go, I've decided I'm going to be the most polite person anyone's ever met. And in my personal life as a child, I realized this, that instead of waiting to be validated by other people, what I found is what feels really good in my body is just to be more polite to anyone than they are to me. It was my first spiritual practice as a kid, just finding the joy of being polite. And when I was around people that weren't polite, it was really difficult for me to make it about me when I was so focused on giving the gift of politeness. And I think there's a really deep uh, spiritual wisdom in that. There's a really deep practice in that where when we really wake up, what we look at is not how people are treating me. We don't want to ignore that. But what we want to define reality by is How am I responding to my own emotional reactions? How am I responding to my most negative thought processes? Not whether I have negative thoughts or I still have reactions, because that's the whole spiritual, um, that's the whole spiritual illusion is I think that if I was awake, I wouldn't have thoughts and I wouldn't have reactions. The problem with that belief is that most of the thoughts and reactions we have are reflections of what is still active in the collective unconsciousness. So they're not our thoughts and our reactions, it's just us feeling where the planet is. So it's not a matter of if you have thoughts or reactions, it's what's my relationship with a negative thought, with a reaction. Do I punish myself spiritually and I don't give myself a gold star because I didn't do the right thing and I didn't get a gold medal in the spiritual academic, you know, decathlon or whatever. I didn't, I didn't win the spiritual Olympics. Or are we willing to give ourselves the space and the capacity to be intimate with our mind, to be loving towards our heart? And the first measurement of enlightened existence, let's call it even that word is very crusty. <laughs> enlightenment is such a weird word. Mm-hmm. It's a weird Anytime someone is insisting to be enlightened, it's the most unenlightened thing you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, usually, yeah. And if you meet with someone who's truly enlightened and they say, are you enlightened? They probably will just start laughing because it's the weirdest. <laughs> it's the weird. Like, like if I'm in line at the grocery store and it says that I can only use, I can only pay, get in this line if I have 12 items or less and I have 14. Do I get to say, well, I'm enlightened, so I get, I get, I get to <laughs> bring my extra shoe. Like, like, what's this great value for this? Right. It's a weird, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, what's like, the prize? Yeah, what's the prize? It's, it's a very strange thing. But I think if we really boil it down to how easily is it for me to be nice to my mind and my heart? Mm. How pleasant am I to other people? How do I treat my kids, whether they're acting appropriately or not? What's my relationship to my spouse, regardless of what I think about their actions and behaviors? How do I view the world, no matter how silly or insane it seems to be? So when we turn inward truly, what we're looking as the first way of measuring where we're at in this whole awakening process, it's what is my relationship and response to myself first and foremost. And from that journey of self-love 
and the healing that is required, everything transforms from the inside out. You've also been, I think, really a masterful teacher on where this gets misinterpreted and utilized in a codependent way. And I think that the spiritually sensitive people, the empaths, the senses, as Vanessa and I call them, we can really, <laughs> the senses, <laughs> good, right? <laughs> we can tip into, we can live our entire lives every moment from codependency. So just a little discernment around that decision. I'm going to be, you know, the most polite and the, the difference between that and constantly running around caretaking. Cause I've heard you give very masterful talks on, on codependency that have helped me tremendously. So I know that that's not what you're advocating. You know? Well, of course. And yeah. I think the problem is, is that, okay. So through all of us, we're all brought together to help each other up level, heal and evolve. And if there is healing work to be done, life's going to do everything it can do to bring to your attention as often as possible, whatever core wound still remains. So if we as senses, which I love the word, <laughs> we as senses, <laughs> as I like to say, never, that's a great word. I like that. Definitely take it. Run with that one. It's all good. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, if we act in a way and someone else has a negative reaction, the first instinct is we did something wrong, mm -hmm. right? The idea of you triggered someone and you didn't do anything to cause it, like most people, most energetically sensitive souls would want to have that kind of confidence, but are completely freaked out thinking, oh, but what if I'm overlooking something? What if I'm not looking at myself? So I think part of the insecure loop is I can't not assume that I've done something wrong. Correct. Right. And then, of course, someone who's being triggered because there's a deep wound in them to be healed is responding and maybe not aware of the deep wound inside of them. Then we need to caretake, get back to being popular with them. And then we get let let off the hook kind of a thing. And I think part of the problem is, is that energetically sensitive souls respect the divinity of other people's souls. But that doesn't mean that their current level of consciousness is operating in a way that is as conscious and honorable as the way many energetically sensitive souls like to communicate, mm. right? So I, I think that we have to know ourselves so well to know that we mean no harm. We are just being ourselves. Now, a very clear, conscious soul would react to something you've said and would say, wow, what you just said really triggered me. Thank you for reminding me of the core wound that still exists inside of me. Thank you so much. That's quite a talent you have there. <laughs> right? And that's a way of acknowledging, wow, you brought something up in me. That's my stuff. Right? It belongs to the one who reacts. Not the one who feels, the one who reacts. But what we have in this world is someone's core wound gets triggered and they blame it on the one that's just trying to help them heal it. Mm -hmm. And so as energetically sensitive souls, we learn that we don't have to blame ourselves for the reactions of others. We just have to live such a life of intention that we come from a place of purity, politeness, and love, and that the love that we shine as light to the things we're healing and hooking in others isn't always a pleasant experience for the other people. So the idea that if I'm always coming from love, it's going to feel good or the belief if I have such a high vibration, then everything always goes my way. Yes. <laughs> the reality is life is doing everything it can to unravel the core wound in our cellular body. It may not be in your conscious mind, but it doesn't mean it still isn't imprinted in your cellular body. And so I think if we really look at how can I love myself and others through their journey without taking responsibility for their journey? I think in that we find the confidence and the awareness to hold space for other people without apologizing for the nothing we've done wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, you even have um, some wonderful t teachings around releasing responsibility. This is going to sound weird, but for ourselves in certain ways, because you know, we start to hook to these identities, right? I am the bad one. I am the weird one, the unforgiven one, whatever the case may be. And we're hooked 
ego. And so we're always blaming someone. Sometimes I notice like we're bouncing back and forth. It's my parents' fault. It's my fault. It's my parents' fault, right? Like the ego just like, it doesn't know what to do. It's just in that blaming zone. So I think when you start to talk about conditioning, I mean, you've said before that 0% of things are really just our problem, right? Right. And we can start to look at um, language. I had a real opening listening to you talk about language on the retreat because you were saying, you were taught how to see the world, you know, from the moment you open your eyes, people through the use of language, they're teaching you how to think about yourself, feel about yourself, think about love, feel about love, think about them, think about the world. And I, you know, it's not that I didn't understand this before, even neurobiologically, but somehow when you start to go down that hole and you go, holy cow, like I never was without conditioning. Right. And then my parents who created my, well, they weren't either. And so no one here is to blame. This is just an interesting scenario of human experience where, um, in innocence, a lot of misunderstandings about what it means to be human and about love and about safety just got passed down through the lineage. So I think it's really interesting if we could talk a little bit about, um, language and Mm -hmm. how it can shape our perspective. Absolutely. I think it's a fascinating one to talk about. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. I mean, I love words. And, um, you know, I never tried to be the kind of teacher that's always trying to flip things upside down. I just started to notice that I have a, a knack for it. And, and uh, you do. <laughs> because if we can flip the world upside down, especially some of these deep spiritual ideologies, it, it's just to expand our viewpoint to be able to experience life in a different way. You know, and, and I think that, for example, me, uh, an example about my life. When my mom wanted to tune in to how I was doing emotionally, she would always ask me, what's wrong? Right. <laughs> and what she taught me was that there's always something wrong with me and I should always keep an eye on it. And what became strange in the beginning as a child, my mom would go, what's wrong? And so I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to get the question right. Right. So I'm assuming there's something wrong with me and I've got to figure it out. I'm like, oh my God, I don't, I don't think anything's wrong with me, but that can't be the right answer because she says, what's wrong with me? So I've got to find the right answer. So I'm now trying to look for a way to be correct with my mother. And I'm trying to answer her question based on her perception of me. And in her perception, if I'm too quiet, there must be something wrong. Mm. And it caused me to perceive myself as someone who can do wrong or that there's something wrong with me. And any time in my adolescent life when something didn't go right, what did I turn, what I turn to? What's wrong with me? Mm. And so it's the words. And again, you know, I don't say this so that we all get freaked out about, oh, my God, words. And, you know, (laughs) it's just a matter of words come down to your subconscious mind has two categories. It has a familiar category and it has a foreign category. And how whatever fits the familiar and the foreign is that combination is called human conditioning. Mm -hmm. So if it was foreign for you to feel perfect and familiar to feel like something's wrong with you, you're going to manifest the experiences that are bringing your attention to what's on the familiar and what's on the foreign. When we wake up into self-realization, we start co-creating. And people hear that term all the time. Like, like what are you co-creating? You're co-creating a new subconscious mind. And through intentional living, through self-love, through spiritual evolution, we are consciously deciding not what our ancestors were familiar and foreign with, but what are we wanting to be familiar and foreign with? Like, hey, I've lived for 40 years with fear being familiar and safety being foreign. And I would like to publicly say that I'm not a fan of that combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, right? No five-star Yelp reviews for that. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite my subconscious mind as the consciousness within all of this so I can shift my subconscious imprinting 
And then my cellular body is going to say, wait, there's different things familiar, different things that are foreign. So all the cellular memories that live by the old combination instantly get cleared out. And I begin to attract things that confirm the new combination I prefer. So when we are waking up to freedom or liberation, we are becoming so liberated that we are deciding how our subconscious mind is encoded, not just trying to be in the utmost peace with the unconscious way it's been created, passed down from lineage to lineage to lineage. So we're breaking the spell of unconsciousness by learning, here's what's familiar, here's what's foreign, and what can I do about it? And of course, that's why I do the work I do. And of course, in this new book, the new book is literally a step-by-step process of all the things and ways and and choices you can make to shift that subconscious imprinting and to make love and safety and joy familiar Mm -hmm. and to allow all the opposite ones to become more foreign. And that's what allows us to feel confident. That's what takes us through the raising of the vibration and allows us to be truly heart centered beings, but without all of the dogma and all of the, you know, pro, you know, overuse processes. Just how do we co-create a different subconscious mind? Because your subconscious mind then becomes a projection of the world in view. So we're literally just at the forefront of learning our co-creative abilities. And one by one, we are all deciding the world we wish to live in by the ways in which we approach and embrace our subconscious mind. Hmm. I'm so glad you brought that all up. I mean, first of all, that it's not picturing a Lamborghini and getting a Lamborghini, <laughs> you know, the co-creation I'll story, the chat. right? Like that kind <laughs> of, that's what co-creation is, is like, bling, you know, I can have this. And, you know, I'm somebody historically, I didn't realize until in the last year that I was a, I suffer, therefore I am person, you know, and your teachings have been so helpful. And also, you know, being on retreat with you, being in the presence, like you were saying of somebody who can hold that energetically, maybe hold is the wrong word, be that. And to feel like, oh, like it's okay. Joy, contentment, just basic good is okay. You know, and, and to see, wow, that was in the foreign category. Right. And there's an option. And so, you know, just to bring up something that, that went on with me, and I know that this comes up for a lot of our listeners too. I think for me, it was a mistaken idea, um, had some big realizations and I went into the lost in space place and started like losing my body, like couldn't use my limbs so much for a while. It was a weird time. Oh, yeah. Like definitely I called it my emptiness bed rest phase. And I, I think mm-hmm. it was a unconscious, a, a mis- first of all, the identification unconsciously with suffering had to create, you know, and I also have a lot of body history. Um, and so I think there was like a belief system operating or an ego conditioning operating that put me into like, Oh, realization means I'm going to be like no thing. Right. And there are plenty of spiritual stories about that. And, right. and yet at the same time, so I can see that there was this funny story operating, but at the same time, you have spoken about the body, I think, so eloquently in that it is th- what's on the journey too. And you're even talking about clearing cellular memory. Oh, yeah. Is there, and I've had many um, listeners and clients come to me and say, you know, because I think senses have a lot of body stories sometimes, is there a mm-hmm. risk is there a risk on this path that I'm going to get really sick, become lost in space, um, break down? I look at some spiritual teachers and they're all so sick all the time. And you are really physically hardy. <laughs> you're the opposite. I mean, when we were on retreat with you, you taught for like nine hours and then Vanessa and I passed you and you're like, go to the gym. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, I know, right? <laughs> and so I'm just, and actually we have a quote here too from you when your ego deteriorates it can deteriorate your body but we can unravel it without it leading to physical deterioration so i just wanted to touch on that because it's a personal interest for me and i get to right. have you here but and i know it is for our listeners last retreat you said something yeah. about dormant viruses coming with awakening and i was like oh, yeah. raising my hand and <laughs> yeah. for my question and 
I, I we have so to let's, know. let's bring the body in, but bo- I'm a body therapist. That's my, oh, main, you really? my well, main that's awesome. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing I have, I, I, in the last few years, I've really come back into my body. And, and, and again, it wasn't like I didn't want to be in the body. Like, you know, I've heard all these like non-dual, like snazzy statement. I'm not the body. <laughs> I, I, I mean, here's the thing. I only knew my path from my intuitive connection. And then I started working with people on all these different paths. And I had no idea what I was talking about, to be honest. I had to piece it all together. And then I finally figured it out. And I went, oh, I see how it is. So let's just talk er- earlier, talked about you were this, you were the personal self and then you went into transpersonal land, which is, mm-hmm. I can't feel my body and all that kind of stuff. So that shift. So you got taken out of small self and got blasted into bigness. Mm-hmm. So I call that contrast, mm-hmm. right? Like compared to how you've experienced your life before, this is now totally different. Now you don't stay that way. And I think a lot of people think, Oh God, I have to stay like this. And then the <laughs> ego's job is to try to keep them lost in space and ungrounded, all that kind of stuff. So I've come back to my body once I realized I wasn't really in a body. And now all of a sudden I have this great desire to care for my body. I've also been blessed with a large amount of psychic endurance and I can teach 10 hours a day and then go, go and you know, all that stuff. <laughs> but the more I take care of my body, the even more endurance I have. So, you know, I think what it is on this journey is, Life's going to, you know, whether it's the awakening of a dormant virus, like all of us have certain viruses inside of us and they go from dormant to active, but they're only going from dormant to active based on if that's going to put you in the right environment for the next stage of your expansion. So I think it's really important to understand Mm -hmm. that, you know, as a spiritual or a cosmic law, everything is always changing, but it literally can't enter your energy field unless it was designed to change you for the better. So life's going to do what it can, wants to do to make you the best you've ever been to help you grow, evolve, awaken, and expand in the shortest amount of time. So it's just life kind of ushering us along. And some people say, well, do, does that mean I have to have it like this? You don't have to have, have it with sickness and illness. Is it common? It totally is. <laughs> yeah. You know, and what's a universal law is when it's time to wake up out of ego Life's going to make your individual reality just one step beyond what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And it will take you through the corridors of boredom, frustration, loneliness, confusion. Those are the four corridors. So whatever life has to do to confuse you, to bore you, to frustrate you, to confuse you, to bring up loneliness in you, that's what causes the ego finger by finger to let go. Because again, we're not letting go of the ego. The ego lets go of us. Mm-hmm. If you are letting go of the ego, then the soul is something up ahead you're chasing. But if the ego lets go of you, you're the soul already. So we are already the soul becoming conscious of our divine perfection. And literally, life's going to be whatever it can be to help us evolve The question is, are we seeing it through the soul's perspective? Are you aware how something is helping you? Are you aware of the evolutionary benefit? And in my book, you know, and what, and I channeled it, of course, but I like outline, how does jealousy help you? How does sadness help you? How does anger help you? And literally you start to unpack the gifts in everything so that you can realize, okay, the, the journey at hand is to realize how something is helping me and to find the safety to receive that gift and to become better than I've ever been before. And so the process is quite courageous. The path is quite direct. Mm -hmm. And our job is to be in full alignment with the universe and to allow ourselves to take that leap and to see that, yes, this may be painful, It may create loneliness. I may get bored. I may get frustrated and confused. But can I dare to see it from the universe's perspective without denying my personal experience? And that middle ground is is maybe one of the most practical ways to explain alignment or Mm self-love. You you speak a lot about, I know we're coming to the end, and so we're going to start to wrap this up, but you speak a lot about it being a process, not a problem, and that through the ego's perspective, really, the ego is like the problem-solving mechanism, right? So it's like, where's the problem? I got to get to work and and solve it. 
And if we could shift to the perspective of the soul, we would begin to see that this is part of a process. And I think we can kind of uh, build a little more on what you just said around that, because it's important. You went so far as to say um, only objects have problems. <laughs> I remember saying that. That's funny. Do you remember <laughs> that? It was really interesting because you talked a lot about objectification, which is something I'm Vanessa pretty and I interested in. Talk about that a lot here. Yeah. <laughs> people who have been objectified quite a bit. And we watch people objectify? objectifying. Mm -hmm. Even very sensitive souls have a way of objectifying themselves and others. This isn't just narcissistic reality. And I thought that's really interesting, right? So, you know, my car breaks down. It has a problem. My ego brain is like the best ally. It's ready to fix it. It's ready to strategize. But when we start to see ourselves as objects that have problems, right. well, this is like next level. So can we speak about this a little more? Yeah. Well, so here's what's interesting. What's interesting to, to, to see is that if he, if someone did not have a problem in their life, the perception of problem would just be externalized to other people or the world. Like, yeah, I'm okay in my life. But what about this president or what about this unconscious yeah. people, right? So it gets deferred. It gets, you know, it gets projected outward. So in the same way, so again, the ego either has a personal problem or it has a personal problem with another. That's mm -hmm. the basic strategy. And it goes back and forth between problem with someone else, problem with no one else, right? And it goes back and forth. But when we awaken from the soul's perspective, everything that once was a problem is a process, so, yeah, I could see it as a problem that life isn't the way I want it to be, but I accept that this is a process and life is doing everything to help me address my core wound and to unravel my conditioning and to awaken and be brighter than ever before. Wow, I'm in a process. And then you see someone else acting ridiculously. Wow, check out that process over there. <laughs> right. Check out it makes it feel a lot different, there. yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's a hilarious thing. So... Ego is the identifier of problem. The soul is the recognizer of process. Mm -hmm. And the difference between problem and process is how often we take the times to love and cherish and adore ourselves the way the universe always does. I like to say that we perceive ourselves as distant and separate from the divine as we are willing or unwilling to care for ourselves. So the less we care for ourselves, the farther away the divine seems, the more we focus on loving ourselves, the more one we are with that which is already awake within us. And when we are in an unconscious reality, we are perceiving problem with self or another. And when we are totally aligned, the things we saw as problems are really just processes. So if someone's mean to me, wow, look at the process that person's in. <laughs> And if that's not an environment that is serving my needs, wow, I'm now in the process of moving. I didn't realize that. <laughs> they have a process and I have a process. And everyone has a process and no one has a problem. Because we're letting the story of life unfold one scene at a time, not assuming it's going to go one way or the other. We're just letting the story be told. And that's really the clearest way of perceiving where we don't have to make conclusions. We can have feelings. Wow, this is not feeling very good. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to make conclusions about life. We don't have to make conclusions about people and others and ourselves. We can just say, wow, I'm in the midst of a process and it doesn't feel good to be in this process. So what do I need right now to better serve myself with the process I'm in? And that caring for ourselves response begins over time to obliterate the reactiveness of ego and bring about the brightness of our soul. Mm -hmm. You also said something to the effect of the busyness of your mind is a reflection of how unintentionally your closed your heart is. And I think, you know, if our listeners didn't get the idea of love and heart yet coming off of you, I think it's so <laughs> important because, you know, as we, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I was always very mystical, but like my ego was always trying to pretend I was practical. So the idea of putting my hands on my heart and saying, I love you out loud was like, no, it's embarrassing. It's corny. No, that's, I should just sit in meditation silently and like force myself to see reality. You know, it seemed 
different. And then as soon as you do it, what I'm realizing is so many of these practices and you do a great job of outlining in both of your books, just how to heal, which no one teaches us how to heal. So that's tremendous. But until I did that, I couldn't understand everything you were saying from the level of soul. So my ego is trying to go, okay, it's a process, not a problem, right? Like have faith and the universe cares and like, you know, and, and it just is like more rhetoric that you're trying to force yourself to believe to create some relief. Right. But as soon as you can shift out of that into the awake soul that's there, it's like, oh, of course, it just qualitatively exists. And it is like I recognize, I think through listening to you at some point, these dimensions of reality are real. And in one dimension, the language was different. The beliefs were different. It's almost like the rules of the game were different. And in another dimension of reality, it's different yet again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting, one, because we keep trying to communicate cross-dimensionally, not realizing people are in a different dimension. And that's interesting. Like, how do we communicate with others? But the other thing is, until people do the practices, it's hard to shift into the soul perspective. Would, Would you agree with that? I, I absolutely would. And so let's just have a fun little metaphor. So if we could go back and relive our childhood, and if we could whisper into our inner child's ear as their future self and give ourselves the best choices to be made that would nullify all the seemingly mistakes we think we've made, if you were able as a child to make far better decisions than you did, would that have allowed you to become an adult faster? Like, could you have made <laughs> such good decisions that you became a 16-year-old adult? Right. Or, or you, you, you needed to take the journey that you took, and the simple reality is, is that the choices you make determine how heroic or heartbreaking the journey will be. So in the same way that a child can't make enough good decisions to fast track adulthood to come faster in the same way in a spiritual journey, we can't make evolution happen any faster, but we can make it feel a whole lot more enjoyable. And that's the reality of spiritual evolution. There are a lot of people promising a lot of things and God bless them and whatever, whatever, they feel like offering and teaching everyone. You know, I look at this field like spiritual teachers are like cab drivers and we all have our own route. Right? <laughs> That's great. And I just focus on my route. I pick people up. I take them where they're meant to go. I drop them off. I see them again. I don't, I do, you know, who knows? I'm just on my route, right? And <laughs> Back on, Cab Driver of the Soul. <laughs> cab Driver of the Soul. Next book, by the way, great title. Next book. Actually, I was on a plane and I, someone, every time someone asked me what I do for a living, I always give different answers. And I, and I, and I just kind of like being different. And they said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a spiritual architect. And they said, what does that mean? I said, I construct and create relationships. <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> and here's my funny little answer. Yeah, well, you're telling the, the truth that time. <laughs> but I, I think that it's really time, you know, for people to receive the most direct path. You know, we talk about non-duality. Everyone wants the most direct path, right? Give me the most direct path. <laughs> Cut my head off. All these ridiculous. Like, we, think, we think because our life has been so difficult to this point that our resolution has to be just as difficult, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. The only been difficult there. thing is surviving the past. Once you, you survived your past, then we can start really doing work in a much more progressive way. But I think that the negotiation ego is, Matt, if I do all of this, will it make things speed up? Mm-hmm. The reality is it won't cause things to speed up, but it will certainly become more enjoyable and less agonizing. So it will seem like happiness is speeding up and sadness is withering away. But what's really happening is we're seeing that it's not our journey that makes us feel any which way. Your journey doesn't make you feel any which way. It's our relationship with our perception of reality that causes us to feel heroic versus hurtful. And that's the opportunity of a spiritual evolution is to say, I'm going to decide and participate in a journey 
that transforms my psychological thriller of a life and turn it into a musical, a yes. romantic comedy, oh, yeah. a Disney animated film, right. whatever you want it to be. <laughs> right? So I think just like when children, you can't tell a child to do the right things and get them to adulthood faster, but you can give them the skills and abilities to drastically increase the quality of their journey. So when we increase the quality of our own emotional journey, whether in the beginning it feels embarrassing or we find shame that comes up or we're too self-conscious of, oh my God, is anyone seeing me love myself? <laughs> right? Heaven forbid. <laughs> like, am I still, do I still look hot when I do this? <laughs> I, I, I've put my soulmate on my vision board and I want to make sure I look extremely <laughs> people around me. Well, if it's on the vision board, yeah. <laughs> well, if it's on the vision board, no, it's guaranteed that. <laughs> right. So, but I think the interesting thing is, is that we have to get really mature about this and say, look, this is not about trying to hack into the universe like it's some giant computer. Mm -hmm. This is not about trying to fool the system. This is about coming out with their hands up and going, look, everything is just here to help me. I'm going to finally get on board. Life lead the way. It's going to be what it's going to be. I'm just going to care for myself and really give me what no one else has given to me before. And let's see how radically transformative and beautiful life can become. When we're ready for that, that's when all of a sudden everything starts to help us instead of hurt us. Mm. That makes me want to cry happy tears. I can't think of a better way to conclude our conversation with you. Mm -hmm. We are so grateful for you and your teachings. Thank you for doing this work. Likewise. It's been a great – we should do this again. I mean, no, don't any have time. Us, because you know we're going to be emailing <laughs> and then <laughs> – no, it's wonderful. I mean, we have so many things we can – talk about with you so many curiosities <laughs> we, um, we had to keep pruning our notes pruning our we, we're not going to be able to talk to him for eight hours <laughs> <laughs> prune the notes <laughs> yeah we did well, hold yeah, you hostage been wonderful. thank you but we're going to look forward to seeing you actually on your book tour we've already yeah. scoped out the dates we're thinking new york so yeah. for all of our listeners who want to join us for that because there is something about being in person for an extended period of time with yourself and also hello, like three to 400 other people who are there with open hearts. I mean, y'all can't imagine what that's like. And if I even told a, an eighth of the kinds of healings that happened the last time I was around you, that masculine feminine thing, like, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, so get the books, but I like to listen to the audio. We usually mm -hmm. recommend people get the audio and do the practices, but come join us. Let's, let's all go bask in the presence of love. Cause that to me is, gosh, doesn't it all just come back to that? Absolutely. I've been such an honor to be able to offer the work I offer. And it's, you know, it's such a, a joy to be able to use my gifts to show people how miraculous and incredible this journey really is. I mean, everything we hear about the journey is 100 percent true. It's just we have to get the right combinations in, in, in place. And so I like to teach in a way that allows the magic, the miracles mm -hmm. to really open up quite quickly and quite profoundly. If we take the path a certain way, everything opens up in a radically miraculous way. So absolutely come join us in person. And uh, again, an honor to be here with you both and an honor to serve the world alongside you. Thanks, Thank you. Matt. Thank you so much.